you all. As I said, this is our final presentation. Um, for those that uh, came to all three of these, our first presentation was learning about your land and its potential with land PKS. Our second presentation was on monitoring vegetation and understanding habitat. And today we're focusing on monitoring soil health using land PKS. So in today's presentation, do a quick overview just to remind you about the input and output modules and such. Um, focus on uh, why and how you monitor soil health. Uh, spend a, quite a bit of time on a live demo and have some time to uh, talk about some resources that are available and especially time for questions. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, but please do um, put messages uh, and questions in the chat and we'll get to those later on in our presentation. As a reminder, soil potential or land potential uh, is defined as that inherent potential of the land to sustainably produce those ecosystem services. So that might be the production capacity of the land, um, also thinking about resilience and thinking about soil health. The app, as you all are, I hope, aware by now, is, a fr is free and available for download for Apple and Android phones. It tells you uh, quite a bit about the potential of your land, um, allows you to access soil and ecological site and habitat information, uh, as well as monitoring soil health and vegetation cover. It also allows you to keep track of those management records. And the report modules are the way you can really access your data. And if you've collected data over multiple time periods, see some of those trends. Uh, the, I wanna highlight that leaf that you see, that shows you where um, information, new information is available when you log back in or you entered some data, it'll show back up. Um, and it, the leaves right now are indicating on this, um, this slide, uh, the places where before you even collect any data, there's already information in the app, log on. Um, that can be about soils uh, from either NRCS or FAO, could be about vegetation with some, some satellite imagery um, and habitat in North America, the species that um, you're within the range for, and then uh, climate. There are also four input modules, um, and we've talked about these quite a bit um, over our two other presentations uh, about soils, so uh, collecting data about your soil, um, land management activities, uh, soil health, which you'll hear a great deal more about in just a few minutes, and then land cover, that vegetation cover and structure information. So today, um, we'll talk a little bit about this uh, land info, just how do you know about what soil you have at your location, and then about soil health. Just a quick reminder, too, about adaptive management. And a um, uh, very simple diagram here about planning and then you go out and execute, monitor and adapt and how land PKS fits into that. Land PKS really does allow you to take inventory information, assess that um, information on your land as well as monitoring. So it is a great tool to help you with all, all those different parts of the adaptive management process. And then where do you establish monitoring? Um, whether you're, if you're doing soil health monitoring or vegetation monitoring, um, you really want to think about the question you're trying to answer. Are you looking at something representative? You want to know the condition of your land overall, or are you interested in, you know, restoration or at a particular location? So think about the scale of your question. Uh, think about um, finding a representative area and then doing a random start to collecting that data. Now I'll pass it off to Jeff. Thanks, Terry. So I'm just going to start by asking people to think about a healthy soil. And I was I was fascinated by the by responses that showed up on Menti. It's actually very similar to I think what I would have uh, would have uh, put up there as well. Um, but just take a look at these images and think about which looks like a healthy soil, which looks like an unhealthy soil. Next, please.
maybe one more. There should be a, there we go. So now, whoops, one back. <laughs> Looks like it's a little bit of a delay coming up on mine. So now take a look at it again with this context, the climate and the type of soil in each case. And tell me if that changes your answer or think about whether that changes your answer. I guess we're, we're a little too big for it. So now, Terry, next, please. So if I were to apply the indicators that we're gonna run through here in a few minutes, um, the one in the center, which I think everybody probably liked, certainly would have come out as, as a healthy soil. That's a, that's a pretty healthy soil, Lot, lots of organic matter, the roots are clearly not being impeded in any way by a, by a compaction layer. Um, pretty good soil structure. Actually, in this case, that's the one thing that, that could still be improved. Um, as it turns out, this soil was, was uh, recently heavily amended uh, with, with compost, with a lot of compost over the last, I think it was four or five years. It's a very uh, coarse sandy soil. And, um, and it's, it's pretty tough to get sandy soils, uh, give them really good structure. And this one still has a little ways to go, um, but it's, it's in pretty good shape. The one on the left, um, it's not actually the area down at the bottom that's the problem. The area down at the bottom is a natural part of the soil. That's calcium carbonate that has accumulated. So you take tums or, or anything like that as an antacid, it's the same thing, but it actually forms naturally in the soil. The problem is up here at the top where I've got platy soil structure, and this is rangeland. It was formerly grassland, and that it's, that's its potential to be grassland with some nice microbiotic crusts and good soil structure up at the surface, um, lots of fine roots. And what's happened with the loss of the grasses, the inner spaces, um, we've, we've degraded the structure. The structure is degraded, and we've ended up with this very platy structure and lower soil organic matter. So those are the indicators there that we look at. Um, this one, actually, in the upper right, is uh, the sandy loam um, is from a, not far um, from the, the, the one on the left and uh, clearly looking a little bit better in terms of organic matter. Um, and even though it's not terribly dark, that's about as good as it gets for organic matter. Now this had the benefit of having been irrigated for about five years, five or six years, um, uh, about 15 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago. And, um, and I think that's probably accounts for, for some of the, uh, the improvements. So it's a little bit unnatural in the sense that it got supplemental water. The one in the lower right, um, clearly that's asphalt, um, actually concrete sitting on top of asphalt, I think, on top of a compacted soil. And actually from a, from a use perspective, you know, it, it may not be a healthy soil, but it's a functional soil. It's functioning for what it's meant to do, which is to support that road so that we can ride on it or, or drive on it, um, transport things on it, et cetera. Next, please. So, um, so I think those, that, that previous slide illustrates the importance of making sure that before you start to evaluate soil health, you know what texture you have. If you start off with a very uh, loamy texture, you're going to have a much higher potential for soil health than if you stay, start off with a very coarse texture, a sandy texture or some indicators. Now for other indicators like infiltration, that sandy soil is gonna have a higher health potential um, relative to that indicator than, than some of the other, um, than a, than a, particularly than a clay soil. And so um, the previous uh, sessions we looked through and, and, and learned how to use land PKS to help identify your soil or at least determine your soil texture. Next please. And uh, I just want to highlight here that I think in the last couple of, of sessions, we, we emphasized the fact that you could use this link from the map soils through to the soil survey and then into the ecological site description information down on the lower right. You can also use it to identify, to access additional soil information through what's called the official series description or OSD. And, um, and if you, you click on the box down there towards the bottom where it says view um, details for Bernardino in the SDE, which is the Soil Data Explorer. This is one of the problems with apps is we're trying to, always trying to squeeze too much stuff into a small space on a phone screen. So we probably use too many abbreviations, but that's this, um, the Soil Data Explorer. Next, please. 
So for the soil health module, we bought, as for the other modules, there's an input screen over on the right, the top tab, and then a report screen and a number of different, um, and this is just a selection of some of the indicators. Um, so what we're gonna do now, uh, next slide, is we're actually gonna go through this, this, um, this whole health module. And this series has already covered the, the land info and it has covered um, the, the land cover modules. And so um, now we're gonna go to the final one. And uh, we're just gonna go to the same plot we used in the last webinar. And I'm gonna go down to the data input screen, the upper, upper right um, tab, scroll down to soil health, and select a date. I can select either today's date or a past date. Um, it's hard to predict soil health, at least I can't uh, very well. There are lots of models out there that try to, but uh, we don't allow you to predict soil health on this. So you can't go ahead and turn. And then I can select either field observations or soil tests. And just very briefly, in the soil tests, for now, we've just included three, um, soil organic carbon, pH and electrical conductivity. We may add additional indicators in the future if there's a request to do so. But, but right now, um, we really view land PKS as being a, a field tool. And so this is just someplace that you can keep additional records if you'd like. Tap on field observations and a whole list of different indicators comes up. And I think what's really important and something that is, um, that's actually emphasized in the NRCS's um, uh, guide to the uh, crop cropland infield um, soil health assessment protocol is that you want to focus on those indicators that are likely to be sensitive to changes in soil health at your location at the time you make out those observations okay and um, and you want to take into context so obviously if I went out there's snow covering the ground here I'm currently in Colorado and I went looking for soil biological activity I wouldn't be able to find the bugs moving around, but I might be able to see evidence that they'd been there. Okay, and so, so you really want to be a little bit careful um, about what you're looking at and, and when you're looking at it. So I'm going to go very quickly through this. We don't have a lot of time um, and leave it to you to, to explore this more in detail on your, on your own. I'll jump to soil cover and um, very briefly click on the question mark text. And one of the nice things about using the app as opposed to using paper is that all the information you need to evaluate that indicator is right there in your data collection system. So when you click on that question mark text, it gives you the definition. It describes the indicator as NRCS has defined it in the cropland uh, assessment. And then it gives you the options for evaluating that indicator and describes where, um, where needed, how to evaluate the indicator with each of those options. And so here we have two options and then the ability to define your own uh, method that you might have used for, for, for collecting soil cover. So if I go to um, land cover, it, this is one case where it will automatically import data from another part of the app. So if you've already collected land cover data uh, using the stick method that we described during the last uh, webinar, it will automatically import it and it will, it will populate here. For the ocular estimate, obviously you would make your own observations. I will say that we've done an awful lot of tests with ocular estimates and um, people generally aren't as good as we think we are at doing ocular estimates. So if you can at least do some sort of a step point or pinpoint protocol, that's probably better if you want to do monitoring. If you're just trying to get a quick assessment, you want to say there's a lot of litter or a little litter or, or sort of maybe half the ground is covered with litter, ocular estimates are fine. So I'll close that just by clicking that carrot, go down to residue break, breakdown, and again, clicking on the question mark text brings up a description of, um, of what residue breakdown is, what it's influenced by, and so forth. And again, here, we're simply giving you five classes. Now, in the NRCS uh, infield assessment, it basically just gives you two choices. It either meets the criteria or it doesn't, criterion or doesn't. 
Um, and what we're trying to do here is provide more classes. So say you started off with one that none or very little, and the next time you did an evaluation the next year or something, it still wasn't as expected, but it was somewhere in between. It gives you the ability to sort of do some monitoring and, and, and keep track of your trend over time. And again, here, I would then just uh, select one of these. Um, and, and of course, you know, much greater than expected is not necessarily a good thing. Um, because it may mean that, that, you know, if we've got accelerated loss of organic matter, we no longer then have residues sitting on the surface. Um, and so you really need to think about these indicators in some cases, is it too much? Is it too little? Is it just right? I think there's a nursery rhyme or story about that. Okay, uh, surface crusts. Uh, um, so this one actually goes through a, a series and first it asks you, are they even present? And then you can start to a answer some questions about the thickness, the level of development, the extent, and importantly, the crust type. And it is actually possible to have more than one type of crust. You can have a biological crust, frequently in rangelands, we get biological crusts that will form on the top of a physical structural crust, particularly vertical crusts. And again, not all crusts are bad. So biological crusts are often good if they occur in areas where we don't have much plant cover. Obviously, we'd rather have plants, but if we can't, we'll take biological crusts in rangelands. Um, and similarly, although normally we think of physical crusts as being a bad thing, again, if you have no plant cover and you have high susceptibility to wind erosion, as the southwestern US does today, I know I just got a wind warning wind warning on my, on my phone for Las Cruces, um, crusts are not necessarily a bad thing. But from the perspective of soil health, we generally don't like health crusts because they limit water infiltration, uh, it's harder for seeds to become established and so forth. Ponding is obviously related to soil crusts and also related to compaction. And again, this is where you wanna think about where you are in the landscape. There are some parts of the landscape where Bonding is actually natural. Okay, if we're in a low part of the landscape that, that naturally collects water, um, that may be something that you would expect. So we need to evaluate this indicator relative to what we expect. And one of the ways that the NRCS, the clues that they give you there, is that it says no ponding on non-hydric soils. Now, hydric soil is, a, is essentially a wetland soil, a soil that, um, that naturally um, accumulates water based on its position in the landscape and often the atmosphere as well. Okay, and again, we've got a, a series here rather than just saying yes or no, uh, there's some descriptions. And then in some of the indicators, we've actually given you a link um, for additional information. In the case of, of soil infiltration, um, we're actually going to provide a link in the future to a new video that we're producing on, on how to measure uh, soil water infiltration using both the single head, the single ring method, where you just watch the water and see how long it takes to infiltrate, and then another one where we use a bottle that slowly, um, where we can actually maintain the level of water and observe the rate of infiltration. Um, root restriction, compaction, um, and, and again, this is one that's sometimes referred to penetrometer resistance. There are a lot of different names for it. Um, so in this case, um, the, the cropland assessment indicator is penetration resistance. What we found is actually observing the soil, digging up just a small hole and observing the soil is even more helpful than a penetrometer because with a penetrometer, a clay soil is gonna be harder than a sandy soil. A dry soil is gonna be much harder than a wet soil. But if you actually go down and you look at the layers, you can learn a huge amount. And, and my um, PhD, my last degree was in, was ultimate degree was in, in applied soil physics. And I was taught to measure everything. Well, it turns out that I can observe and detect problems with compaction with my eyes much better than I can with any measurement. Now, if I want to monitor changes in compaction over time, penetrometers are great as our measures of bulk density and, and so forth. But if I actually want to figure out if compaction is a problem, meaning whether it's restricting water infiltration and root penetration, then 
taking a look at the soil, taking a close look at the soil is just incredibly valuable. Aggregate stability. For a while there on Menti, that was popping up as the most popular indicator. And I will tell you that it is actually my favorite indicator because if you have good aggregate stability, you generally have good organic matter and high infiltration for that soil. If you've got good, solid, stable aggregates, they're, they're nicely glued together, they've got to have organic matter in them. I mean, that's what basically holds things together. Clay helps, but clay will disperse if you don't have any organic matter in there. And again, if you've got good aggregates, you've got space between them. Aggregates basically are defined by not the aggregate itself, but by the space between it. That space is where water can move down through the soil profile. Soil structure, obviously related to soil um, aggregates and, and the stability. But here, we're actually looking at the type of structure. And I know this gets into terms that people say, that's geeky soil scientist stuff. Well, it is, but the terms are actually adjectives. They're pretty descriptive, granular. It looks kind of like a sand grain, but a little bigger. And it's got stuff glued together. Blocky literally looks like a block. Platy, imagine a bunch of paper plates or, okay, we wouldn't throw uh, glass plates, but paper plates that you kind of throw um, or drop as you're carrying them to the picnic table onto the ground and they just kind of scatter a little bit. And the way they stack up often looks an awful lot like platy structure. And that was what we saw in that first picture in the upper left corner. Uh, and then we, we described that for different depths. Um, and I should note here that um, you can actually change the depths up here in the upper right if you'd like to. Now, we suggest that you, you decide what depths you're going to use before you start the process rather than after we've already um, gotten part way into it. Um, but you can decide what depths you want to make these observations. Um, and you can see where I actually did enter some data, I'm getting a little green check marks. Again, a reminder so I know which, which ones I've already completed. In some cases, I just skipped it over. So color, uh, we actually went through that in the first webinar, so I won't again. Um, but um, you can determine soil color a couple of different ways. Um, and we use the Munsell soil color, which has something called hue, value, and chroma. And we can make this evaluation either using a Munsell color chart, a little book where we compare to the, the color chips, the paint chips, or we can actually go down here to more and um, and go to the soil color tools. And without creating a plot, or you know, if I haven't already created a plot, I can literally just go in there and, um, and determine my soil color. Um, using using the app and, a, and some sort of reference. Um, so back into soil health. Plant roots. And I'm going to start going a little faster here to get through. Um, three different questions. Um, and you select all that apply. Okay, and again, there's a good description there in the, in the question mark text. Biological diversity, this is really one of the hardest ones to evaluate because it's so dependent on timing. I will also say that like the other indicators, but especially for this one, it's very important to not look in just one spot. You definitely want to just walk around with your spade, throw it into the ground, pull up uh, a chunk of soil, Break it open, see what's inside. Okay, um, because the 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 bugs are 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 um, are dispersed pretty widely. And if the soil is pretty dry and you're looking for earthworms, you're going to want to dig down a little deeper too. They're not going to be hanging out there waiting for you trying to get a sun pain. Okay, biopores. Um, again, one that varies quite a bit. You definitely want to look around um, not just one four by four area, but several. And you'll see here we have this little add button in for a number of the indicators that'll, that actually encourages you then to go and um, say, I saw two there in the zero to six. I'm not gonna do the six to 12 today. I put add, I can do another one. The next spot I had zero. 
Next one, I can do as many as I'd like, okay? And, and we really strongly encourage you to, to, to look in as many locations as possible. We selected the 10 by 10 centimeter area um, just because that's uh, a standard area that's actually used by NRCS soil survey when they define uh, biofloors. But you can look in, in any area you'd like. It's just important to, to standardize it um, so that you can go back, especially if you're monitoring. So make that decision. Runoff and erosion is actually one of my other favorite indicators and the only one in here that didn't show up. But actually somebody put it in the chat. Um, somebody, somebody in the chat when we started the meeting said, hey, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens and who has healthy soil when the snow melts. And how do we do that? We literally go and we see whose fields has runoff patterns at the edge of it. And by runoff patterns, I literally just mean those patterns of, of litter redistribution and, and sand grain redistribution right at the soil surface. We're not talking about rills. We're not talking about gullies. We're just talking about evidence that water has moved across the surface. Um, we do have an indicator then for rills as well and for gullies. And finally, I love the fact that somebody put soil smell and then said LOL here, laugh out loud. Um, we do actually have an indicator for soil smell, and it's maybe not one of the best indicators for monitoring, but it's a great one for assessment. You pick up some soil and you don't smell anything. It means there's no biology there. There's really nothing happening. And if you then wet it up, if it was dry, and you still can't smell anything, either you've got a massive head cold, or, and I'm sorry, it, it sounds like it is a COVID symptom, you've got COVID, um, or it's really not, it's not a good soil. Um, if it smells kind of rank, um, that means that you've had a lot of water ponding there. And again, go back to that ponding indicator. Maybe that's natural, maybe it's not. Now you gotta look at where you are in the landscape. Okay, so um, I just wanna highlight that we just put together a soil health training video, and this is actually some, some clips from it, um, where we illustrated some of these concepts by comparing three different soils, one underneath a pine tree in the upper left, one here in this, this garden, actually the garden that I was referring to earlier. In fact, you already saw this picture uh, in that first slide. And then this one from a pecan orchard, which is off here to the right, um, pretty compacted soil, which is common for pecan orchards. It's pretty hard to manage those things uh, given the amount of equipment and irrigation and so forth. Um, that video should be available later in April. Carolyn Kershaw is on the call is working on that right now. Next, please. Again, when in doubt, refer to the question mark, especially for soil health. There's just, there's a lot of information there. Next, please. And finally, uh, just uh, reiterating, this, this is a global tool. You can use it anywhere in the world. With that, I really wanted to thank everyone and um, we I'll stop sharing and we will take questions. All right, Carolyn and Tegan, are there questions that have come in the chat? We've got a question from Chuck. How accurate are ESD predictions in areas with high topology, canyons, mountains, et cetera? Does it only use the Sergo data or climate or other data? That's a really good question. So that it's basically asking the ecological site dis um, descriptions or ecological site predictions. In other words, from the soil map, the soil map is predicting the soil or soils in an area. And then from that, we're correlating that with an ecological site so a group of soils of a similar type. And essentially those soil maps are very, um, you need to be very careful in using those maps in both areas with high topology, with high levels of topography, and also in very flat areas. So where um, our home is in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and where you, where you saw, actually the area where you saw those, those photos right at the end where we did the soil health video, there was literally a sharp change in texture just five yards away from where I was standing. And there was another sharp change in texture, another 30 yards away. And you couldn't tell by looking at the surface. 
and they were all part of the same map unit. So the dominant soil that was mapped there was one soil, but they're actually three soils in very close proximity to each other. So you always, you really, if you're gonna do a soil health assessment, it's worth verifying which soil you're on. And again, the land PKS land info module can help you do that. So soil maps in the US are phenomenally high quality and they are getting better and better, um, but it's, you know, basically, you, it, it, it's hard to predict what you can't see and you can't see things without digging a hole. We've got a question from Savannah. Do you have any guidance on how frequently to monitor the soil health indicators or does this just depend entirely on the site factors, goals, et cetera? A good question. It definitely depends on the site factors and your goals. Um, and so typically, um, there are very few situations where you'd want to monitor soil health more than once a year. And we, we try to do it at the same time each year. Um, there are some areas where you're really not going to be able to detect significant changes more than once every five or 10 years, particularly areas with low rainfall. There's just not enough production. So we think of soil and soil health as being the driver, but the soil health is actually, and it is, it's a driver of, of, of you know, of, of, or, or determinant, I guess, of, of, of a lot of ecosystem services, but it's ultimately driven by plants and also management. But ultimately, it's the plants that put the carbon in the ground. It's the plants that that that, that create the pores or produce the the the, um, the food source for the for the soil biota that create the pores. And so, if you're in an environment where there's just not much happening, then you're probably not going to want to get out there um, and try to measure very often. I would also say that um, a higher replication, so making sure you're covering the soil variability is probably more important than going out super often. So if I had a choice between making five measurements in a field um, once a year and making 10 measurements in a field once every two years, I'd probably go and make 10 every two years. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you a tighter estimate, which is going to increase your ability then to detect that change. Thank you. That's a, that's a really good question. I have a couple more slides to share, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, see if we have any while we wait to see if there's other questions that come in. We wanted to thank all the folks that have um, worked on this today. Jeff, do you want to say anything in particular about anyone here? No, just I mean, thanks very much to the Nature Conservancy. Terry uh, Tegan May is also actually running the show in the background here. Um, has been a great collaborator with support from the nature from the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, through a conservation innovation grant uh, that's supporting this webinar series, and then um, close collaborations with a couple of universities. And uh, big thanks to the USA Agricultural Research Service that basically um, allowed me to jump off on what at the time seemed to be a fairly risky proposition with support from USAID uh, a number of years ago. Now. Great. And I'll end, it'll let me, oh, there we go, um, with some additional resources and such. And um, anybody want to say anything in particular about this? Just highlighting going to the website is really important. Lots of great information there. But beyond that. Yeah, on our website, landpotential.org, we have all kinds of training materials for all of the Land PKS modules. So if you're curious about how exactly something works, you can go to our Knowledge Hub and watch training videos. And then we have articles with lots of background information. So check it out. We actually have another question from Brian. Are there any plans to include the capture of plant SAP analysis along with visual indications of plant performance, e.g. number of branches per stalk, number of heads per branch, seeds per head, etc.? That's, that's an excellent question. And, and as somebody who has worked on, on rangeland for much of my career, we typically use plant and soil indicators together as an integrated package. So we don't actually on, on rangelands, we don't look at soil health, we look at rangeland health. And we're trying to look at the health of the whole system. And we use whatever indicator we can find. Um, and so I, it'll be interesting. We have not considered including those particular indicators in the Land PKS app yet, but we could. And I'll be really interested to see how the conversation about soil health 
evolves in the context of sustainability and regenerative agriculture and, and all these other sort of conversations that are occurring at the same time as we start to, I think, move out from using soil health as a foundation, but really looking at, at ecosystem health. And, and yes, absolutely, those are all super relevant. All right, thank you all. Um, take care. <laughs>